Last on our speaker, uh, speaker set before the panel, we have Charles Coletta. He is from the Four Star Group, and he's going to be having a chat to us about the challenges of, sm of small factories in China. Welcome to the stage. Okay, I'm going to give you a little bit different perspective on uh, <coughs> co compliance, uh, especially environmental compliance issues in China, because I think there's a very unique situation that exists there. Uh, I've been working in China for about the past 15 years, and I, I do have a unique perspective. I've been in over 1,000 factories as an auditor, as an inspector, as a buyer, and as a consultant. So I've seen a, a lot of the situations that exist. Um, right now, I'm the uh, uh, Senior Vice President for Quality and Compliance for Four Star Group. We are a trading company that deals with uh, almost all major retailers in uh, the U.S., in Europe, and some in South America. So we have over um, 2,000 products, consumer products that we're that we're manufacturing, and uh, being manu and that are being made in about 1,000, but actually 1,200 factories, um, mostly in China, but also in um, Vietnam, Cambodia, and Philippines. So really, as as you've heard in many of the presentations up to now, environmental compliance can be a challenge almost anywhere, and certainly is a challenge in Asia. But uh, I think that in China, because of the predominance of small factories that are doing production, it, it can become a very unique challenge. Um, there, really, there, there are well over 10,000 small factories in China that are producing goods for sale in the U.S., in the EU, and in South America. Um, a small factory, this is my definition, uh, really it's 100, about 100 workers or less. Like I said, there's over 10,000 of them supplying, supplying all major retailers. And you wonder, you know, what, well, why do retailers work with the small factories? Um, many times they work with them just through direct imports, but more often they're dealing with them through a broker or a trading company such as my company or as a, a subcontractor for finished goods, or as a Tier 2 or Tier 3 supplier, I think, as was mentioned before. So it's, it, you know, it, it's as, as difficult as they can be to deal with, uh, it's almost impossible to not deal with small factories in China. Um, subcontracting really is, is much more pervasive than people think uh, be, because of the flexibility that it allows um, small factories, almost all small factories in whatever kind of product they're making, whether it's injection molding, metal forming, whatever they're doing, they're going to be in a, in a network of what they call sister factories. And uh, they, they all know each other very well. They will assist each other. So if a certain factory has an order and maybe they got uh, a, a new contract and they're having trouble fulfilling their terms, they will turn to their sister factories to help them to complete production. And oftentimes this will be totally um, uh, unknown to, to the buyer. So really, so why work with small factories? Um, it, it because of the, one of the reasons is because of this uh, flexibility that, that I mentioned. Um, you know, oftentimes you, uh, you, if you need a product quickly and you need to maybe make changes along the way to the product and you want to have that kind of flexibility, then small factories are the way to go. The larger factories are normally not going to give you the kind of speed and flexibility that you can get. Um, certainly cost is, uh, is, is lower. Um, it it or still is. It's, it's kind of uh, it's changing a little bit because it t tends to be lower because small factories tend to do a lot more handwork. Um, which means they're going to be a little bit cheaper. Labor costs are cheaper where they're doing this. And uh, so they can keep their costs down a little bit. Um, certainly, again, speed, because they, they can ramp up to test much quicker than, than the larger factories do. Um, they tend to be more um, open to innovation. 
if you want to work with the factory to try new ideas, to try a new process. Again, the smaller factories are much more able to do this than the larger factories. And, and location. Oftentimes, you just want to choose a factory that's going to be close maybe to your, to your shipping or to your, um, uh, to your research and development, something else. Then you can usually find a factory that's going to be closer to where you want to be. Those are the reasons that, that you really would choose a small factory. So what are the compliance challenges? Um, what, what makes compliance difficult to manage in the small factories? Uh, certainly price and cost, and what I mean here are by the, the, the driver. Um, keeping cost down, which is one of the, again, the primary reasons for using small factories, means that, that you want to reduce overhead as much as possible. And certainly they're going to look at price and cost as overhead. We'll get into this in a second. Actually, on each one of these, I have a little bit of a discussion point that we're going to go into. Um, yeah, so price, cost. In the small factories, again, profitability is based upon very small margins, but, they're, uh, but they're, uh, they make their profit by, by doing a lot of turnover, a lot of rapid work. So adherence to foreign, foreign compliance regulations really from their standpoint, it's just viewed as a reduction in profit. Why should we have to do this? And I'll get into a little bit more of this in a, in a few minutes. Um, another challenge that you'll find a lot with the small factories is, is documentation. They, it's, they're very difficult to keep documents. Um, they don't normally have a compliance office. They may not even have a QA officer. So it's normally the production boss or maybe even the factory boss that's keeping documents. And if they have the documents, they're going to be handwritten. Um, so it's, it's difficult to trace through. And, and there's also, you may be aware that there's, there's a, um, not a policy, but there's a, a practice in China among small businesses of keeping two sets of records. It's kind of their internal records and their government records. So oftentimes when you, when you want to look at, if you, if you want to trace documentation for, um, for environmental compliance, it's very difficult to even know what documents to look at. And, and, and translation is, is, always a, uh, is always difficult. I, I went in one factory and asked to look at some water treatment uh, compliance documents that they had. And I was given a uh, purchase order for bottled water from Taobao. So y you really don't, you have to be careful of what you ask for and what, and what they supply to you. Um, the lack of technical knowledge, is I, this is one of the biggest challenges. As I said, the smaller factories normally don't have a formal compliance officer or group or department. And so the, so the technical knowledge is going to be quite low when it comes to some of the issues that we're dealing with here. Um, you, you try to explain phthalates to, to the factory boss. I mean, it, it's difficult for anyone to understand exactly what a phthalate is. They have no knowledge of, of what a phthalate is and, and what it means. Um, and things like REACH, ROS, um, CARB, they, they don't, they don't really understand either what they are or what the purpose is of them. Um, as a matter of fact, you know, CalProp 65 labeling requirements, I mean, they're a mystery to me. And trying to explain this to the factory about why some things to be labeled, some things don't need to be labeled, uh, be, because of a court settlement ruling, again, it, it's just, it doesn't mean anything to them. So uh, you have to act as their, as their compliance group many times to be able to explain what you're doing. Um, again, I think like Brian explained in his, uh, it, it was excellent talk he gave about um, the EPT in China. Um, the smaller factories are really going to be a lot under the radar, even though China is cracking down a lot more on environmental standards. And again, they're, they're using this, this tax method for to be able to, to get companies to track and limit um, restricted substances. But these smaller factories tend to fly a little under the radar. The Chinese government tends to focus a lot more on the larger factories. And there's also this concept of, I think Brian mentioned this too, it, it, uh, most of this is dealt with on a local level. 
and there's i think the word he used was manipulation and there's a lot of manipulation that goes on at the local level if you know certain people you know certain government officials maybe you can schedule your your audits or maybe they don't even don't even do on it's you know that it's it's much more difficult for the government to control what's going on in the small factories but it doesn't mean that the factories don't take advantage of things like e p t I've noticed recently uh, I've gone for a couple of unannounced audits to a factory, and when I get to the security gate, the security officer calls to the factory, and there's a conversation that goes on, and he comes back and tells me, no entry, we're not working today because there's a government environmental audit going on. Well, I look, and I can see all the e-bikes and all the bicycles, and everything seems to be working on but, but they're now kind of using this as as a way to be able to avoid um, unannounced audits to say that they're closed because the government has closed them for their own environmental auditing um, subcontracting again this is one of the most as I, I talked a little bit earlier this is one of the most difficult things to control because because companies keep this so opaque and, and they, they want to keep it that way. They, they don't want you to know when they are using their sister factories or other factories to help them in production. And so e even if you do a pretty good job in environmental auditing, you get your paperwork, um, you've done your audits, and you have a pretty good idea of, of what they're doing, that may be only 60% of the actual production that, that you're receiving. 40% may be coming from three other factories in three other provinces that you don't even know about. And, and that can make it very challenging. You, you really, uh, I'll talk about solutions at the end, but it's so important that you develop a good relationship and a good partnership with your factories so that they will be comfortable in discussing with you about subcontracting and you let them know that you're not going to penalize them for this, you just need to know for, for your auditing purposes. And, uh, but it's again, it's it's funny how the uh, the small factories will really take advantage of when, when they need to. Um, I had an issue with a product that um, failed some uh, some testing that was done in, in the U.S. And when I went back to do a corrective action with the factory, and uh, when I asked them, you know, what happened, you know, how could the, it, the, the products had lead in them? They found lead in the U.S. And I asked them, you know, how could this happen? You know, we're doing our testing here. You know, and they said, oh, well, th that was the last 20% that came from our sister factory in Ningbo. And I said, well, you know, we asked you about subcontracting. Why didn't you tell us then? Well, we didn't think it was important then. Well, but now it's important because they have someone else to blame for, uh, for, for, uh, for a failure. Um, spot purchasing with small factories is also an issue. Uh, larger factories tend to set up long-term contracts to, for supplying their normally like, uh, third-tier materials. Small factories, because they want to remain flexible, normally buy things on the spot market. So it's very difficult to maintain certifications. You have to, as, as a buyer, you have to really be diligent and keep up on uh, and check on the supplies that they're getting because they may be buying from supplier A today, supplier B next week, supplier C the week after that. So it, it can be quite challenging to keep up with uh, spot purchases. So solutions, because you're probably thinking, you know, why would you ever want to deal with, with small factories when hearing about the problems? But, it, but you can deal with it, and uh, it can, they can be very, very good relationships that you can develop. Um, one, of the, one of the primary ways is to incentivize the factory. Come find the reason that's going to make a difference to the factory to be able to do this. And I'm going to do a little role-playing here, um, and I'm going to show you a, a, a typical meeting that we would have, and this, this is something that occurred to me because we went through a program I'll talk to in, in a minute or two about, uh, about CFCs, the CFC use in China. So we had a meeting with the factory boss. Here, I'm going to be the factory boss, and then I'm going to be the QA compliance manager. Okay. So the factory boss, you've asked us to limit our use of CFCs, but this is going to increase our cost. So please tell me why we need to do this? Well, CFCs are harmful. 
this is going to be something that's going to be very good for the environment and for your children. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and also, China is a signatory to the Montreal Protocol, and, and, and your country has agreed to limit them. Mm -hmm. And Walmart and Carrefour will look at you much more favorably and will probably give you more business. Oh yes, we hate CFCs. We're going to reduce them immediately. I can tell you that we're coming with a program now that we'll get rid of them. You just have to find the right incentive that, that's going to make a difference to them to be able to work with them. And then you'll find that you won't have a problem. Um, also training. And, and I don't even, I certainly mean training of your factory partners. Again, because oftentimes since they don't have a QA or a compliance group, you're going to have to be their acting group. So you're going to be the one that's going to have to train them. But also internal training. This is, this is personal for me what we have to do. I'm going to do a role playing exercise again and show you, and this is very typical. This is, as the QA manager, I'm, I'm with the buyer, the merchandising manager, and we're meeting with the factory people. So I'll be the merchandising manager first. Okay, we're here to talk to you about um, making our purple widgets for us. And I have a few questions. Um, the first one is, can you reduce your cost by 30%? Okay, the second question is, can you ship by next Tuesday? Great, great. Okay, thank you. And then this is me whispering in his ear. Oh, one more question. Does the product function properly? <laughs> oh, most of them? Great. Glad to hear that. Okay. Thank you. And I'm whispering again, whispering in his ear. Um, and he's saying, really? Do we, do we have to? Do we have? Oh, do you use any hazardous materials, haz hazardous substances in, in your production? Uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, how do you spell plutonium? <laughs> So, so we've had to have many training sessions within our group to train our merchandisers to do their homework up front. Don't wait until we're well into production when orders are filled to be able to uh, talk about the companies and, and their, their environmental programs um, that we can do to, to help meet our customers' needs. Um, I, I talked about partnerships. I think that that is it's one of the things that in, in my time with Four Star, I've really stressed that if we can develop partnerships with our factories um, where, where they, we, we trust each other, and uh, then it, it's so much easier to, to, to do the work, to, do, to trust what they're going to tell you, that they'll, if they're having an issue, you can work with them to get it solved. And again, the, the, the diligence oversight. I, again, I keep repeating that you have to act as the compliance manager for your factories because they're, it, it's not that they don't want to do this. They just don't understand it. They have no idea what to do to, to be compliant. Um, it, 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 for, I mean, just an example, you know, always, and, and some things that you have to do not working with the factory, like when we send our auditors and inspectors into factories, we've trained them now how to look for evidence of subcontracting because we just know that they're not going to tell us. And, and that's one of the, the ways that you really get into trouble is uh, you, you think you've got a handle on it, but you, you're getting product from a location you didn't know. So we, we've taught our inspectors to look for Shipments to look for, you know, the evidence on the on the assembly line or on the line of how, what their production is, and does their production and production rate match the amount of product that you're seeing? If it doesn't, if there's too much, they're getting product in from somewhere else. If it's too low, it means they're going to get product in from somewhere else, and we know we know what to look for on this. Um, just a few little examples. I, I talked about. The, this CFC program. This is something that Four Star has done in conjunction with some of their uh, some of the U.S. clients, and uh, where we we're, we're in, again incentivizing our customers to reduce CFC use. It's um, 
again, it, it, it's, it's difficult because, because first you have to do just the education to them to explain what CFCs are and why. And again, as I, with the example I gave and why it's a good idea for them to do this. Um, CARB, you know, the, uh, in the U.S., California Air Resources Board, limitations on formaldehyde. Um, and again, this, this is an example uh, of, of where just the, the communication is, is, is sometimes tricky. Um, we went into one factory because we were considering using them as a supplier. They were making MDF port. And uh, we had heard that they had a, an excellent, excellent labeling program, an, an excellent, uh, and we went in, all our product was labeled. It, it, was, it was very impressive. And I was talking to them, I said, well, can you, you know, show me your test data? I'm, I'm so impressed with what you're doing here. And they were looking at me, and they're looking, and they go back and they talk a little bit, and they're saying, what testing are you talking about? I said, well, you know, you've labeled your product as compliant. And they were, no, we, we just, we know that our product is compliant. We don't have to test. We, we, we know that it is. And so, again, you, you, you just have to be careful, especially with these smaller factories, to do this. Thylates also, again, because this is such a big issue now, both in the U.S. and Europe. And, again, this, this is an example. We, we're, we're going through with all of our factories right now. And um, we, ha we will build testing programs for them for their suppliers because, they, because, again, they don't really know it and because they, they, they tend to buy so many things on the spot market that we have set up, make it, made it very easy for them to sample, to send us, to send, send sample to us. We will test, we will test at our own cost um, to be able to, in, in, and once the factories figure this out, that it's easy when it protects them, then, then that they're much more compliant with us now and working with us to send samples to, so that we can keep up with uh, Keep, you know, keeping track that they are all phthalate free. So that's really it. Any questions we're going to do separately? Yes. Okay, thank you.